Uh, I'm honored that you would come out to hear me. Um, there are such illustrious people who are speaking today, and uh, it's a privilege. I'm usually with the U.S. team, and so being able to speak with the U.K. team is a real blessing. Thank you, Michael, and, and the rest of the team for having me. Um, I, at first, I was a bit hesitant to, to come today because uh, I have my exams uh, at Oxford in a few weeks, um, and so it is a lot of preparing, and I said, if I come, can I... Can I leave early? Um, and they, they said, yes, you can, you can do that. And I said, can I speak first? Uh, and they said, no. <laughs> uh, and at the time, I was like, well, that's upsetting. But now I figured out, uh, after being in Oxford for a while, I realized I'm an American. Um, <laughs> and it's really obvious to people who aren't American. Um, and I think it would have been a disservice to you to have an American go first, um, jar you from your sleep. Uh, so. Um, There'll be a little bit of passion coming, I think, uh, in the next few minutes, but if you'll forgive me, it's just where I'm from. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to start out by saying that um, becoming a Christian was the most painful decision of my life. The most difficult decision I had to make, not just intellectually, but personally, because I knew what it came with was going to be sacrificing everything I had up until that point. So a lot of people, I, I, I heard preaching quite a bit in, in the U.S. were saying, oh, are you addicted to drugs, or do you want to be saved, or, or, or has somebody hurt you? God loves you, and if you become a Christian, then, then it, it'll be great for your life. I knew it was going to be the exact opposite. The moment I became a Christian, everything would become a nightmare. But the problem was, for me, I had studied the evidence now, I, I, I saw a lot of people who believed in what they believed because they found it personally compelling. They liked the message. For example, a lot of the people around me who were Muslim loved Islam. In fact, I did too. And that was the reason why they stayed Muslims, because they loved the religion, or, or they enjoyed the culture, or their family was Muslim. And so for those reasons, they wanted to stay Muslim. Uh, and, and it wasn't just Muslims, it's everyone uh, that, that I knew, generally speaking, their reasons were not based on theology, not based on evidence, but just based on either convenience or personal social comfort, not pointing the finger, those are important issues. But for me, I wanted to know what was true. And there was a certain day in the summer of 2005 when I realized I no longer believe in Islam. I hadn't come to that point where I said, I denounce Islam. I just realized it had happened. I had studied the evidence enough to where, in order to be a Muslim, you have to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. And you have to believe that Allah has sent Muhammad, and that Muhammad came with the Quran, with Allah's divine law, and that Islam is the way you're supposed to live your life. Sharia, which is the, the how to live as a Muslim. Uh, that is divinely appointed. And after having studied the evidence, I realized there was no good reason to think that. Uh, I'm not here to talk about Islam today. I'm just getting you to where I, what I came to. Whereas on the Christian side of things, in order to be a Christian, there, there's a lot of trappings to Christianity. Various views of Christianity believe various things. Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, they all have different traditions. But there is a mere core Christianity, which is the belief that God himself came into this world, that he died on the cross to save us, and that he rose from the dead as proof for his claims, but also as the firstborn risen from the dead. Now, when I studied the evidence on those matters... Pay attention, I, I, I am saying evidence because those were all things that would have happened in history, right? Jesus, a man, would have lived in the first century. It's a historical thing, a man living 2,000 years ago. You can look at the history and determine, is there good reason to believe that? Did that man then claim to be God? Does history corroborate that? Does, does the recorded pages in our text show us that he claimed to be God? Did he then die on a cross? If he died on a cross, that's something that would have happened in history. And if he rose from the dead, do the events surrounding Jesus' death point to, as the best explanation, that he rose from the dead? As a Muslim, while I was studying the, those issues, by the way, they're all explicitly denied by the Quran. You know, the, the Quran says, Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 157, Jesus was not killed, nor was he crucified, but so it was made to appear. The Quran denies the crucifixion of Jesus, but when you turn to the pages of history, Jesus was certainly crucified. The evidence is very strong. If you have questions about that, we can talk in the Q&A. 
Did Jesus claim to be God? The uniform testimony of the early church is absolutely he claimed to be God, and he proved it by rising from the dead. The evidence surrounding Jesus' death three days later, when we look at the historical evidence, if you put it on a historian's glasses and say, how do I explain this event? The best explanation by far is that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. So I came to this dilemma where I realized my parents, as Muslims growing up, they had told me, Nabil, Islam is true. That's why you believe it. But I came to this point where I realized the evidence is soundly in favor of the Christian faith. I love Islam, but I don't believe it anymore. But to take that next step, to take that step of saying, whatever it costs, I will embrace this message. Do you realize for people all around the world. To do that means to give up family, to give up friends, potentially even give up their lives. We hear about it, we see it all the time. We can can read stories about it if you just go online and take the time to find out about your Christian brothers and sisters who are being killed for their faith. Now the suffering that I was staring at was probably the greatest hurdle to becoming a Christian. For me, I didn't know it at the time. I would have given you intellectual reasons. But for me, deep down, I can see this now retrospectively, it was actually what I would have to give up. I loved my parents. I mean, my, my, my mom was the daughter of a Muslim missionary, the granddaughter of a Muslim missionary. My father, he came from the Quraysh tribe, which is the tribe of Muhammad himself. There was a lot of pride in that. All that they did in their free time when they came to the West was they they spent time serving Islam by by building into the local Muslim community, spending their time at the mosque. So their whole life centered around Islam. And I want you to understand, this is a a, a bit of a difficult um, paradigm to grasp if you've only ever lived in the West, but in most places in the world, people function on honor and shame paradigms. So your reputation is tremendously important. It's, it's what you've worked for your whole life. And if I became a Christian, not only would I be endangering my own relationship with everyone around me, but my parents who have loved me, who have sacrificed everything for me for ever since I was born, I would be taking their reputation and tossing it into the mud. Because, oh, your one son became a Christian? That tells us a lot about you. So not only would I be suffering myself, I would make my parents suffer for this decision. Was I ready to do that? These were the hurdles that I was facing, again, subconsciously. I didn't realize that that was what was keeping me from embracing the Christian faith. But I remember reading in Mark chapter 10, verse 29, that Jesus knew about this, that this was actually a common occurrence even in the time of Jesus himself. He says, anyone who leaves father or mother or brother and sister or crops and fields for the sake of the gospel will not fail to receive a hundred times as much in this life along with persecution and in the next life an eternal reward. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. I read that. And at this point, I already intellectually knew that the evidence was soundly in favor of Jesus being God himself incarnate telling us, if you suffer... On my sake, you will be rewarded tremendously. Yes, you will suffer even more, but you will be rewarded tremendously. In fact, Matthew chapter 10 said that if you want to to serve Christ, you have to be ready to suffer. You have to be ready not only to give up your family, which is specifically what it says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, but you also have to be ready to give up your life. He who does not pick up his cross and follow me is not worthy worthy of me. I don't know how the Christian message has been presented to you, but I want to sort of rearrange, maybe revamp some of the pieces. Nothing new, but I want to align it in a slightly different way for you. I don't have too much time. Uh, I want to make sure we have enough time for questions. There's always a problem when they give a guy from a Middle Eastern background a microphone. Um, (laughs) It's not going to be done in the amount of time they suggested, but uh, I will try my best. By the way, I was in medical school when I was studying a lot of these things, and most of my friends who were in medicine with me were atheist or agnostic. They had been trained up 
in, in a secular environment, they were tremendously successful. In order to get into medical school, you have to be really smart, you have to study really hard, and be at the top of your class. At least that's how it worked with the people around me. So they were really successful, which meant they were really self-reliant, which meant they were trying to explain the world in such a way that they could be in complete control of themselves. And, and that was the paradigm with which everyone saw the world. But the problem with that was, how do we explain to someone, and I remember doing this when I was doing my psychiatry rotations, there was a guy who had crossed the median of, of the highway and, and just ran headfirst into an oncoming truck. And we were busy piecing together his body. We had uh, the, the metal halo that we called it around his head so that everything would be in place. And as we were healing him, we asked him, what happened? Did you pass out? Were you dehydrated? Uh, tell us what happened. And he said, my wife left me. And no matter how much we tried to piece his body back together again, I knew that unless we addressed his heart and his mind, he would go right back out and do the same thing. And none of the people I had been trained with had adequate training to address his heart or his mind. Because why do you tell someone, no, you should live? Why do you tell someone, no, 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 don't commit suicide? What reason can we give them if all we've told them is that life is a sheer accident? You just happened to evolve out of chemical mixtures and time and chance. That's all you are. And all your life is about is a few years, 80, 100 if you're lucky, and you will die and it will be over. That's it. If you're not enjoying that time, why not cut it short? There's no good response. And in fact, that was exactly what Jean-Paul Sartre said. He said, I, I, I understand that life is meaningless. What I can't figure out is why I haven't killed myself yet. From the atheist perspective then, suffering becomes a true problem. You try to mask it, you try to hide from it, you try to increase your pleasure, but, but nothing actually addresses the reality of that suffering. And as Amy said, Nothing actually makes that suffering evil. If there is no objective morality, whatever you suffer doesn't matter. Which means if you're in the middle of a holocaust, you can't call that evil. Seriously, from the atheistic paradigm, there's nothing that made what Hitler did truly evil. Now you might say, well, we're supposed to let humanity survive and take care of others, social contract theory. No, there's no reason to force people to sign up to a social contract theory. We can talk about that in the Q&A, if you will. So from atheism and agnosticism, the problem of suffering is an intractable problem. But I wasn't an atheist or an agnostic. I was a Muslim. And from my perspective, what it was that, that made suffering bearable for a time is that it was a test that Allah was giving us. And if it's his will for us to walk through this test, and we would pray earnestly for Allah to give us the grace to be able to get through this test. Uh, some of, sometimes you may have heard that Islam is a graceless religion. That's a caricature. We prayed for Allah's grace all the time. Uh, and, and the point was, though, to get through this test. But the Christian faith is absolutely unparalleled when it comes to addressing the problem of evil. Not just because of what Amy talked about before. Not just what, because of what Vince is going to talk about shortly. But what I want to share with you is as a Muslim coming to realize the truth of the gospel, I went from believing that God created this world, stood back and watched you and judged you. And maybe he'd answer your prayers, sure. Maybe he would, maybe he would help in those ways. But ultimately, he was watching you to see how many hoops you could jump through, how much you could please him, so that at the end of time, would you or would you not make it into heaven, he will make that call. Got to pray five times a day. Got to fast during the month of Ramadan. Got to make sure I give my zakat. I got to make sure I go on pilgrimage. I got to make sure when I wake up in the morning, I say these prayers and I wash up and do the wudu, constantly thinking about how to please God in hopes that ultimately I would be in his good books. The Christian faith tells us that God himself, knowing we were not able to save ourselves, was willing to step into this world. 
Okay, this isn't a God who stands back and watches you suffer and jump through hoops. This is a God who rolls up his sleeves, steps off his throne, and says to the angels, any one of which, if we saw them, would just blow us away by their brilliance and their radiance. He says to them who worship him constantly, I am coming into this world as a baby. Have we thought about this? The creator of the universe was able to create it like that. We can't even fathom our little corner of the universe. He was able to create it by speaking into existence, and then he steps into it as a helpless baby. Born to whom? Born to two children who had just been accused of an illegitimate relationship. Have you thought of that? Joseph and Mary had been accused of an illegitimate relationship. The moment Joseph did not dis- abandon Mary was the moment everyone said, aha, you impregnated her before you were married. So from that moment on, Jesus was born as an illegitimate child to two parents who did not have any of the social graces that were common amongst people who had honor in an honor and shame society. And then as he grows, what does he do? He lives as a carpenter, working with blood and sweat and tears. This is the God of the universe taking on a blue-collar laborer's job. Ultimately, he befriends fishermen and and tax collectors and people who aren't necessarily the highest in honor and, and dignity. And then he pours into them, living with them day and night, going place to place with them, knowing he is going to be betrayed by them. One of them would betray him with a kiss. And then he would go to a post to be flogged, and then he would be crucified. We put crosses up everywhere. A lot of us wear crosses, not necessarily realizing how rough the image is of a cross. Do you realize that this was designed to be the most painful, the most humiliating way to die ever devised in human history? Do you know how we kill people now, at least in the States? How do we execute people? We give them a lethal injection. And before we do that, we sterilize the site so that they don't get infected when they're dead. I don't know exactly why we do that. But but that's how humane we've become. We want to make sure that even in death, they have their dignity. Not the cross. Okay, Cicero tells us that people's skin was hanging from their body in ribbons. That their intestines would have fallen out just from the flogging process. That they would be strapped to a splintered piece of wood for every single breath they took. They would be scraping their skinless back on that wood. The creator of the universe did that for us. This is a Christian message. And we asked ourselves why. Because if you, you, have been born into an illegitimate family, you can know that God loves you enough to identify with you and to take your burden upon himself. So that if you have had to work day in and day out to make ends meet, that God loves you enough to take that burden upon himself, to enter into that suffering. If you have ever been betrayed by someone who said, I will love you forever, I will die with you, and the next thing you know, they've betrayed you, even with a kiss. God knows he enters into that suffering. And if you've asked yourself, why me? Why this physical ailment? Why is my body broken? Why why am I the one who has to face this kind of suffering? God died on a cross out of love for you. This wasn't incidental. And this wasn't just a meaningless gesture too. By the way, it's really beautiful. A lot of us understand how beautiful this is. But the beauty is that it doesn't stop there. Because he doesn't just say, hey, I love you. And that's it. What he says is, this is me and you were created in my image. So I want you to suffer with me. Because people are worth it. Are you following this? You were made in the image of Christ. Christ suffered for the sake of others. He wants you to carry the cross with him. This wasn't just flowery language. Pick up your cross and follow him. Suffer for the sake of others. Why? Because in this world, people are killing each other. People are dying apart from God. And the message of grace, the message of love, which flows out from the Trinitarian God 
and only is possible to flow out from the Trinitarian God. That is the message, unconditional love and grace, which will heal this world. But in order for you to heal this world, for you to be Christ's hands and feet, you have to carry his burden. You have to suffer alongside of Christ. How many people are perpetuating the cycles that they have fallen into. They abuse their children because they were abused. They're alcoholics because their parents were alcoholics. They're addicted to sex because everyone around them was. How the cycle is perpetuated, how is it going to break? By no means except for the hands of God. But that's you. That's you. He's expecting us to walk in as his hands and feet and bring grace into this. So the point that I want to make for those of you who are note takers and you're like, I, I, I don't know what to write. <laughs> point number one is God suffers with us. Point number two is God suffers for us. He died on the cross so that we could have eternal life. Point number three is that God invites us to suffer with him. Let's turn this paradigm around. Suffering can, it's not God's ideal, but God is able to use everything for his glory, and if we are suffering, God can use that for his glory. He redeems the suffering. Oh yeah, in Islam, Allah would overlook things if, if, if he wanted to. Were you addicted to, to sex? Were you addicted to something? Pray, and Allah may, if he wants to, overlook that. The Christian God redeems it. Not only does he rescue you from it, but then he says, now go, rescue others with the grace that I have given you. He redeems your suffering. What you're going through, I don't care what it is, can be used to liberate people. It is for freedom's sake that Christ has set us free, and he sets others free through us. We are his hands and feet. He suffered for us. He's calling us to join him in that suffering. I'm going to end with this. We call ourselves Christians. Most of us in this room anyway. The word Christian means little Christ. That's what the word means. One of the Ten Commandments is do not take the Lord's name in vain. Now the Hebrew there carries the connotation of, of carrying. So stubbing your toe on something and saying, oh God, that's not taking the Lord's name in vain. Taking the Lord's name in vain is carrying the name of Christ and not living how he lived. <clears throat> Do not take the Lord's name in vain. But I believe you're here today because God has called you to something greater. I want us to be able to see suffering as even a tool that God can use for his glory. He has used it, and he will continue to do so for those of us who heed his call. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Nabil. Now, I think we're going to get some questions coming up on the screen. Is that right? Um, and uh, here we go. Um, so, uh, right up there at the top left, then, um, how about do you want to take that? If free will leads to suffering, and there's no suffering in heaven, does that mean there's no free will in heaven? Now, we, that is connected in with um, Amy's uh, question, but why don't you give it a... Yeah, uh, I, want, I want us to... Uh, I want to get through as many of these as we can. This is a good question. Um, I want us to re-envision what heaven is, okay? It's, I would say it's not as much a place as it is a relationship. Those who want to have a relationship with God, those who seek him earnestly, the Bible tells us over and over and over again, he answers their call, he meets them. Matthew 7, 7, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened for you. Jeremiah, those who earnestly seek God will find him. So time and again we're told heaven, God, is what we're seeking for and what we're getting. Now, in heaven, will there be no suffering? Yeah. We are displaying, we are, we are acting out the free will that God has given us in this life. And once we, and I don't know if your paradigm is Calvinist or Arminian, but it works in both cases, whenever we end up with God, at the end of this life, he fully sanctifies us by the time we go into the next life. So we will be as Christ in the next life. You look at the way Jesus was in this life, that will be us in the next life. Could Jesus have sinned here on this earth? Will we sin in the next life? 
I think our, our will will be redeemed, we will be sanctified such that we will not sin in the next life, there will be no suffering in that life. But that will be an outflow of the decisions we make here. Your time here on this earth is extremely important, by the way. The only time that you can fight for others, for suffering, pour out your life to help others, is now. And if you're a Christian, keep that in mind. Okay, great. Well, let's just take uh, one here from uh, the cards. Here it says, um, what is the eternal destiny of those who suffer if they don't know Christ? Will God really uh, send them to hell after everything that they've been through? Interestingly, the name on this card is Michael Ramsey. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was born out of my experience of walking with you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we are talking about heaven, are we not? Um, Okay. This ties on very nicely with the question that we just talked about. Will God really send them to hell? I don't think, and, and different Christians have different views on this. I don't think God sends anyone to hell. I think we choose hell for ourselves. If you decide to put God first, again, whether that's by his grace or your own free will, whatever, if you decide to put God first, I think God is then what you will receive in the afterlife. And God says, you wanted me, you will get me. Guess what? I am the source of all life. I am the source of all joy. I am the source of all peace. I am the source of bliss. You wanted me, you get all that. But if you wanted something else, whatever it is, money, fame, drugs, God says, okay, you did not want me, fine. You get what you want. And that is the exact opposite. If you're you're moving away from the source of life, guess where you're moving? To death. If you chose not to pursue life, you have chosen to pursue death. If the source of all happiness and bliss and joy is over there and you have chosen to walk here, I think he he ends up respecting what you have decided. So he doesn't throw people into hell. I think we choose that for ourselves. Okay. And let's just stay over there. If you stand too close, you make me look fat. Um, Let's just... um, (laughs) I told you we were looking for truth today. So, um, again, let's come up to the top left-hand corner. Uh, I think these are the questions that were coming up specifically as you were speaking. Um, As an ex-Muslim, how can we dismiss spiritual experiences had by people of other faith, or or should we dismiss those spiritual experiences? Yeah, again, I I don't think we should uh, dismiss other people's spiritual experiences. We should listen to them. We should walk with them. We should understand what's going on, and if it's difficult, pray about it. Um, I think, so I want to answer this on two levels. One is, um, I, I think people do, of multiple religious backgrounds, have spiritual experiences. We don't necessarily know where those experiences are coming from. Might they be demonic? Well, in the book of Acts, we do see a girl being able to prophesy because of a demon. Sounds like a good thing, being able to tell the future, but it's a demon that's doing it. That's one. But two, God can send his reign on the just and the unjust. And if people are are sincerely praying to God for guidance, he might give them something, some kind of spiritual experience. Um, So let's not be hasty to try to dismiss other people. Let's actually walk with them. And if we find something that's particularly difficult, here's point number two. Do not be afraid to follow the truth where it leads. Because if you are really pursuing truth, guess who called himself truth? I am the way, the truth, and the life, says Jesus. If you're afraid of truth, you're denying that you believe he is the truth. So pursue the truth. And I tell you, every time I have done it, at least, I have found Jesus waiting for me at the other end of that pursuit. So don't enter into this saying, how can I dismiss or how can I, uh, you know, defeat the, the argument here? Uh, if it's something like this, which, which legitimately is, is a difficult thing, uh, pray for God to give guidance, rely on the Holy Spirit, and let him lead you to the truth, which is Christ. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, um, oh, now we have a tie here. Um, uh, between, we've got two 17s, I can see. So, I mean, do you have a preference between two 17s? Um, one, Jesus is suffering, Jesus only suffered for a few years, so what's significant about that compared to maybe a lifetime of suffering in an individual? Um, you know, um, again, this was actually one of my questions uh, when I was thinking about you, again. Um, uh, you know, do you want to tackle that? No, this is a great question. Um, again, this gets to the heart. I was in, um, someone just reminded me of this over the break, I was in Johns Hopkins uh, a few years ago with Vince, uh, and we were doing a talk on suffering, 
Uh, by the way, Vince has a fantastic book uh, called Why Suffering, along with uh, Dr. Zacharias. Check it out, read it. We were, the book had just come out, and there was a woman who came up to the microphone, um, and she said to, to us um, that when she prayed to God for him to give her his heart for people, uh, she found out she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Shortly after that, when she came to terms with this devastating illness, um, and she started praying to God again uh, to, to give her his heart, uh, she was diagnosed with cancer. And she's saying, why is God allowing this to happen to me? This is a very difficult question, and it's, it's important that we not try to minimize the power of these questions. I just want to give you one angle of, of what I hope will be insight, which is that when we have everything we want, when everything is perfect, we aren't necessarily the nicest people to be around. We can become very self-conceited. We can, we can think we have all the answers. Um, Jim Carrey, I think Nancy Gifford tweeted this out the other day, so if you want to follow her Twitter account. Jim Carrey, who's uh, a, a multi-million dollar actor, he said, I hope that everyone can fulfill all their dreams, get all the money they want and the fame they want, because they'll realize that's not the answer. The times that I have drawn closer to God have always been when I was on my knees. The times that I have drawn closer to people is when we have shared suffering together. And so this question, Jesus' suffering lasted for a few years, my suffering seems to last a lifetime. Number one, you don't know how long Jesus suffered. From his birth, he suffered for our sake. Getting off the throne of heaven and coming into this earth, I think, was much more humiliating than the cross. But number two, he makes us new through our suffering. Suffering builds us into better people. In fact, if you stay in your comfort zone, you just end up shriveling. It's a very clear illustration with your muscles. If you never lift, if you never push them, you become atrophied and weak and unable to do anything. That's how we function as people. We need to step outside our comfort zones. We need to stop seeing suffering as necessarily something evil. We can see it as something that God can use for his glory. Thank you. All Which right. is why I maintain my relationship with Michael. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. We probably have time. Um, although I'm just wondering, maybe if we go to number 12, because I know, given your background, also this is a part of the world I've visited too. Um, Dr. Zakia Naik, for those of you who aren't familiar, very, very well-known um, Islamic apologist, uh, Pakistani background. He studied both Islam and Christianity. He chose to be a Muslim. Um, he debates Christians. He seems to win. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts about this that? This is a very specific person. Um, Zakir Naik is in India, and he has a following of millions of Muslims. Um, he has been challenged by many Christian debaters and scholars to debate, uh, and he says no every single time. Uh, I've personally challenged him to a debate, and he has said no. Uh, the people he chooses to debate are people who don't know anything about Islam. Um, <laughs> If you watch the debates he's had, there are people who don't know what they're talking about. And the way he wins is by reciting facts. He just says, okay, this verse of the Quran says this, this verse of the Bible says this. He just recites stuff. It's not exactly a pursuit of truth, um, which is why I'd like to challenge him so that he could, you know, so that this chicanery could be seen by many. Um, don't, don't be taken by people, okay? People have uh, an ability to fool many, even in Mark chapter 13. Jesus says that there are those who would fool even the elect if they could, and they will do miracles. Don't be taken by people. Pursue God. Pursue truth. Follow the argumentation. Ask the Lord to lead you. Um, but Zakir Naik poses no threat to Christian scholars and debaters who actually are willing to challenge him. See online, by the way. We, we put up a video of all those Christian scholars who wish to debate him that he's rejected, and I was one of those. Okay. Well, next time Nabil comes to share next year at the training day, he'll be speaking on how to handle rejection. Um, it's going to be a, a great. It's going to be a great talk. Um, we make videos every time <laughs> someone rejects us. Video. Okay. Um, well, look. Instead of going to the top left, how about we go top right? Because um, I know this is a question. We'll probably come back again in the panel time. It's a very thing. Why did Jesus have to suffer in order to conquer death? I mean, why not? If he is who he is, why just? Do it. This was a difficult issue for me when I was a Muslim. Um, by the way, a lot of these issues that have to do with Islam and Christianity, I've addressed in my book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, and in one that I specifically focus on all these questions, No God But One, which comes out in the summer. Um, but uh, uh, you can find it for free online, too. Anyway, um, <laughs> why did Jesus have to suffer in order to conquer death? 
God is absolutely amazing. Let's look at the word absolute in there. In order for God to be God, by definition, he has to be the greatest, not just in reality, but the greatest that we can envision. Are you with me so far? God has to be conceptually the greatest being. That's how we define God. Now, if I, if I came up with an idea of someone who's absolutely just, what would that mean? Let's picture a judge who punishes every single crime. That would be an absolutely just judge. He punishes every single crime. He makes sure that everything is paid for. But he wouldn't be merciful at all. He'd be the complete opposite of merciful. If we picture a judge who's completely merciful and forgives everyone their crimes, he might be absolutely merciful. But he's not absolutely just. He's overlooked all these crimes. The difficulty then is reconciling this. If, if God is just and God is merciful and he's both absolutely just and absolutely merciful, how can he do that? How can he forgive everyone and punish every crime at the same time? Most religions don't have an answer for that question. Islam's answer is, in Allah, Allah kulli shayin qadir. Isn't Allah able to do anything that he wills? Whatever he wants, we don't know. Christianity has an answer to that question. It's every single crime has been paid for because God took it upon himself. And everyone has been given mercy because he's offering everyone mercy through a relationship with him. How does that work, by the way? Uh, I'm going to end with this, I think. Um, because many Muslims then push back and they say, well, Nabil, that's not just. How is someone else able to take your, your punishment? Or how does that work? We do it all the time. When, when you go to get your first major loan, whatever that is, after your university studies, do you go to buy a house or do you go to buy a car? Who do you have to have sign with you on that contract? Usually your parents. They're co-signers. And what they're saying is, if my child defaults on their loan, if they can't pay this, I will. And that's perfectly legal, it's perfectly just, and we can transfer our debts to our parents who love us enough to pay them for us. God is perfectly able, because he became man, to say, as a man who is able to bear the punishment of other men and women, I am co-signing with this person. Their account is my account. Unbelievable that God in his righteousness would do that for us, knowing that we have defaulted already. But then he takes our sins upon himself perfectly just. Our amazing God has managed to both hold absolute justice and absolute mercy in tension. That's why Jesus has to suffer, because he takes our suffering and pays it for us. Thank you, Nabil. Thanks, brother. Let's give uh, Nabil another round of thanks, Robin. Thank you,